This is a child from Madagascar. At first glance, you might assume she's African, and you'd be right, partly. But if you look closely, something feels unusual. Her features don't quite match what most people expect from someone born in Africa. That's not just a personal impression, it's a pattern you'll see again and again in Madagascar. Across this island nation, things don't quite fit the map. Malagasy doesn't sound like any other African language. The architecture, food, and even traditional farming techniques have elements that seem more familiar in a distinct region of the globe. And if you look at the DNA, things become even more surprising. So how did this island, located just a short trip from Mozambique, end up with a population unlike any other on the planet? The answer is hidden in the island's deep past. Madagascar was uninhabited for most of human history. When people finally arrived, they didn't come from one place. They came from two completely different parts of the world, and they brought with them different languages, tools, customs, and genes. In this video, we're going to trace the origin of the Malagasy people using archaeological findings, linguistic links, and, most importantly, genetic data. We'll look at how the island was first settled, how its people became a unique blend of two worlds, and why the Malagasy genome is still one of the most unusual in all of human genetics. By the end, you'll see how a remote island off the coast of Africa became the meeting point of two ancient migrations, one from the west and one from the east. This is my great-great-grandfather, and yesterday I was able to see him for the first time. Thanks to my heritage for sponsoring today's video, tracing origins across the Indian Ocean made me look into my own ancestors. My heritage makes it easy to build your family tree and find relatives thanks to their huge database of over 36 billion historical records and more than 90 million registered users. I've managed to put together a family tree of over 200 people in just a few clicks, going back up to 10 generations. Start with adding the magic seven, which are yourself, your parents, and your grandparents. This allows MyHeritage's algorithm to search for matches in historical records and other users' family trees. It increases the chance of adding an entire branch to your tree automatically through instant discoveries, which showed me my great-great-grandfather I had never heard of before. In fact, this allowed me to see his face for the first time. I've used the MyHeritage photo features to enhance, colorize, and animate his picture giving life to a photo that is over 100 years old, and seeing it made me realize just how closely he resembled my grandmother. My family tree goes as far back as the 17th century. Surprisingly, my oldest ancestor was born just a few miles from my father's birthplace in Normandy, which means that my family had lived there for at least 300 years. I also found a record of my grandmother's great uncle, indicating that he was killed in combat in northern France during the First World War. If you want to learn more about your family history, start building your tree today. Use my link in the description or scan the QR code in the top corner for a 14-day free trial. Madagascar is one of the largest islands on Earth. Today, it's home to over 30 million people. But for tens of thousands of years, it had no human population at all. While humans were spreading across Europe, Asia, and even reaching Australia and the Americas, Madagascar remained empty. Despite sitting just 400 kilometers from the African mainland, no one settled it until relatively recently. That long isolation had consequences. Madagascar's animals and ecosystems evolved without human influence. Lemurs, small primates found nowhere else in the world, thrived in the forests. Giant flightless birds, similar to ostriches but much larger, walked the grasslands. Other creatures, like the fossa, tortoises, and even unique types of frogs and chameleons, also developed in ways not seen anywhere else. So when did humans finally arrive on the island? And how do we know? Some groups in Madagascar describe a mysterious group called the Vazimba, short forest dwellers who lived in the highlands before being pushed out or absorbed. Some scholars believe this might refer to the island's first settlers. But there's no firm genetic evidence for a lost or vanished population. For a long time, it was assumed that the first settlers must have been African, arriving by boat from the nearby coast. But over the past few decades, new evidence has pointed in a different direction. Archaeological traces like pottery, animal bones, and tools show that the first permanent settlements date to about 1,500 to 2,000 years ago. That's very recent in human history. But what's even more surprising is what those early settlements contain. The tools, crops, and materials don't match those used in East Africa at the time. Instead, all the genetic and archaeological data point to the same conclusion. The first people to live in Madagascar came from far away and they arrived with technologies and knowledge that allowed them to cross long distances by sea. They were the first to step foot on the island, but they would not remain the only ones for long. 
When linguists began comparing Malagasy to other languages, they noticed something strange. It didn't resemble Swahili, Somali, or any Bantu languages spoken in Africa. Instead, it sounded more like languages spoken in Southeast Asia, specifically on the island of Borneo. Malagasy is an Austronesian language. It belongs to the same family as Malay, Javanese, Tagalog, and even Hawaiian. Its closest relative is the Manyan language, still spoken today in southern Borneo by inland river communities. But it wasn't just language that linked Madagascar to Southeast Asia. How did Austronesian people get there? The exact route is still debated. Some researchers believe they traveled along the coast of India and across the Arabian Sea. Others think they may have island hopped through the Maldives or Seychelles. But regardless of the exact path, the distance was massive, more than 7,000 kilometers across open water. These settlers formed tight-knit communities. Over generations, they adapted to the island's environment, created new customs, and likely had little contact with the outside world. For several centuries, it's possible they were the only inhabitants of Madagascar. But over time, others came. And unlike the first group, these newcomers didn't have to cross an ocean. They came from much closer, just across the Mozambique Channel. And their arrival would forever reshape the island's population. They didn't speak Austronesian languages. They didn't farm rice or sail outrigger canoes. But they would become just as important to the Malagasy story. At some point after the first Austronesian settlers arrived, new groups began to reach Madagascar, this time from the African mainland. These migrants were Bantu-speaking people, part of a broader movement that had already spread across much of Central and Southern Africa. They likely traveled by boat across the narrow Mozambique Channel. The distance may be short compared to the Austronesian journey, but the impact was enormous. These Bantu groups brought their own crops, like sorghum and millet, as well as ironworking technology. They also introduced cattle herding, different housing styles, and new cultural practices. Over time, they established themselves along the western and northern coasts of Madagascar. What happened when these African newcomers began interacting with the earlier Southeast Asian population? The two groups mixed, but not in a simple or symmetrical way. Genetic studies show a clear sex-biased pattern of ancestry. Most of the Y-DNA, inherited from fathers in the Malagasy population, is African. Meanwhile, much of the mitochondrial DNA, inherited from mothers, is Southeast Asian. This suggests that African men and Southeast Asian women were the main contributors to early Malagasy families. This pattern wasn't unique to a single village or time period. It appears consistently across different regions and studies. It reflects how the population was shaped not just by migration, but by social dynamics. Who married whom, who formed families, and who passed on their genes. The result was a population with ancestry from two completely different parts of the world. And it didn't happen all at once. African groups arrived in waves over several centuries. Some settled permanently, while others came through trade or seasonal migration. By the end of the first millennium AD, most of the island had some mix of African and Southeast Asian ancestry. But the proportions varied widely depending on location. Still, something else was happening alongside this mixing. Population growth, expansion into new regions, and the development of distinct cultural identities. Different groups began to form in different parts of the island. Some leaned more toward their African roots. Others kept stronger ties to Southeast Asian ancestry. And even today, those differences can still be seen not just in genes, but in language, appearance, and tradition. Today, if you look at the DNA of Malagasy people, you'll see a mix of African and Southeast Asian ancestry. But that mix isn't the same everywhere on the island. In general, most Malagasy carry around 60% Sub-Saharan African ancestry and 35% Southeast Asian admixture, with a small amount, roughly 5%, from West Eurasian or Indian sources. That last piece likely comes from later trade networks across the Indian Ocean, involving Arab and South Asian merchants. But how exactly does this ancestry vary across regions, and what explains those differences? Let's start with the highlands. Groups like the Marina and Betsileo live in the island's central region, at higher elevations. These populations tend to have the highest Southeast Asian ancestry, sometimes more than 65%. This is likely because they descend more directly from the original Austronesian settlers, who moved inland early and stayed relatively isolated. On the other hand, groups living along the west and northwest coasts, such as the Sakalava and Antakarana, often have over 80% African ancestry. These areas were closer to the African mainland and more exposed to repeated migration and trade. 
This geographic structure likely reflects how the population grew after initial admixture. Different regions saw different rates of mixing, and those patterns were passed down over generations. So even though Madagascar is a single nation today, its population is still genetically diverse. Some regions reflect earlier Austronesian roots, others bear stronger African influence, and these differences haven't faded over time. They've stayed in place, passed down in family lines and community histories. The result is a population that is genetically mixed but not homogeneous, a mosaic shaped by where people settled, who they married, and how their communities grew over centuries. Today, Madagascar is a modern nation. Its people share a national identity, speak the same official language, and participate in a common political and cultural life. But behind this unity, the traces of its unusual past are still there, especially in the DNA of its people. The legacy of the two founding populations, Southeast Asian and African, is still visible across the island. It's not just a historical curiosity. It's embedded in family trees, spoken accents, and the physical appearance of people in different regions. But if these migrations happened over a thousand years ago, how have the differences lasted so long? The answer lies in geography, demography, and social structure. Geographically, Madagascar is a diverse island. Its central highlands are separated from the coasts by rugged terrain. Travel between regions was historically difficult, especially before the colonial era. As a result, Populations in different areas remained relatively isolated for centuries. That isolation helped preserve local ancestry patterns. In the highlands, where the Marina and Betsileo live, people remained in more closed communities. These populations grew mostly from the early Austronesian settlers and experienced less influence from later African migration. In contrast, the coasts, especially the west and north, remained open to African migration and trade for much longer which gradually increased African ancestry in those areas. Demographically, small founding groups had large impacts. If a small population with mostly Southeast Asian ancestry settled early in one area, their descendants would maintain that ancestry unless there was significant mixing. In many regions, such large-scale mixing never occurred. That's why the differences between coastal and highland populations have remained so stable over time. And socially, certain customs may have reinforced the patterns, in some areas, intermarriage between groups may have been limited or controlled by social status, political alliances, or geography. Over time, these boundaries, formal or informal, would help maintain distinct ancestry profiles. What's remarkable is that despite all of Madagascar's internal movement in recent history, its genetic structure has stayed largely intact. Modern studies show that even today, individuals from different regions often carry ancestry patterns that reflect their local history. These aren't small variations. The differences in Southeast Asian and African ancestry between highland and coastal regions can be dramatic, and they tell a story that stretches back over 1,500 years to the arrival of the first settlers. A story of two continents meeting through long journeys, small settlements, and gradual mixing. Madagascar's genetic story is one of the most unusual in the world. It brings together two distant populations, Bantu-speaking Africans and Austronesian sailors from Southeast Asia on an island that had never been inhabited before. These groups arrived separately, they spoke unrelated languages, used different tools, and had no shared history. And yet over time, they built something together, a population, a language, and a culture that combined elements of both origins. The mixing wasn't equal in every place. Some regions kept more of their Southeast Asian ancestry, while others leaned more heavily toward their African roots. And that variation has stayed in place preserved by geography, community structure, and patterns of settlement that stretch back over a thousand years. The Malagasy are the result of a process that took centuries to unfold. A process shaped by the sea, by distance, and by the human desire to explore and settle new places. Quick reminder that you can start uncovering your own story with MyHeritage. Just click the link in the description or scan the QR code to get 14 days free today.